morning, everybody. I'm happy to see your faces here. Welcome to the introduction uh, of a brand new meetup. I would like to introduce the uh, meetup founder, uh, David Wilkinson, also the CEO and founder of Darkstar, uh, Mr. Wilkinson. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this first meeting of Quantum Technology North Carolina. This is uh, something we've tried to spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, this is a very, we have a very special guest with us today. Um, and, and we also appreciate all of you joining us. So um, uh, without any further ado, Dave, you want to set up the... Yes, yes, no, thank you. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're here for, for two hours and uh, I will uh, uh, just, uh, I'm the moderator uh, for today. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce the speaker bios, uh, introduce uh, Darkstar. Uh, we'll be back to Mr. Wilkinson. As to differentiate uh, from myself, we're both Daves. Uh, I go by Dave and Mr. Wilkes goes by David, but we'll use last names. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into our uh, guest uh, speaker, uh, Colonel Joe uh, Booker, and I'll do a proper introduction at that time. And just a shout out uh, to some friendly faces and uh, Cody Lynn, uh, who I saw last night uh, at the Quantum Kid Meetup. Good to see you, Cody. Uh, what we have here is the, the welcoming uh, of quantum technology from youth and up. Uh, this is something unique that Dark Star that represents. And we're so happy to see that. Uh, shout out to Sharanya. Uh, Sharanya is one of our Dark Star interns. Good to see you, Sharanya. Uh, Sharanya has created Robotica, which is an AI robot uh, that will have the Dark Leaf product, which is uh, a robot uh, that will be used uh, in one of our presentations, one of our projects uh, with the uh, Defense Department is our plan. And uh, hello, Alexander. Good to see you. Uh, Alexander uh, takes care of Quantum Amplify, uh, helping us move uh, towards the, the circular economy. Uh, and we wish to do that uh, with uh, quantum technology. And we're doing that with the, with the support of the Defense Department as we achieve those goals, as well as financial goals uh, for uh, the US uh, and uh, affiliates. Now, uh, Let's talk about uh, Darkstar, as Darkstar is the, uh, the sponsor uh, for, for today. And what we're looking to do here, as I mentioned, is to create the quantum ecosystem to achieve the circular economy through Quantum City, which we'll learn about started 10 years ago from Dr. Faisal Shah Khan. Uh, and uh, this is a good time to speak to Dr. Faisal Shah Khan about the scientific merit. Uh, Dr. Khan uh, is also a founder of MESA, the Middle East and South Asian quantum technology meetup, uh, which he co-founded with a number of scientists. Uh, and in this way, we have the uh, UAE and Khalifa University uh, as support where Dr. Khan was a teaching professor uh, for, for 10 years. And Dr. Khan, uh, as well, is the founding chief science advisor of Dark Star, as well as the chief product officer. Uh, and my role, by the way, uh, is, uh, for example, as chief project officer uh, of Dark Star. And in this way, we have science and project management coming together for our product, and we iterate this process. We're very excited, uh, uh, Fessel, for the work that you have done. Perhaps you can give a brief introduction about that work so we can appreciate uh, the work that you've done with your scientific papers, uh, which have uh, given rise to companies, for example, Quantum Computer Inc., uh, as well as a company by the name of Microsoft, I understand, who came up with Q Sharp which can be traced back to one of your, your papers. 
It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Faisal Shah Khan. Uh, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, it's uh, it's a very flattering uh, introduction. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I can build up on that a little bit. Uh, I, I can start by mentioning the uh, work I did um, 15 years ago, I think now, or 16 years ago, while I was still actually a PhD student uh, on uh, what is known as uh, logic synthesis, quantum logic synthesis. Uh, it's the notion that you figure out how to compile programs on quantum computers, right? Quantum hardware. Uh, and this is the work that you were referring to that has kind of uh, been built into not just Microsoft, but pretty much any, uh, you know, micro code or machine language level programming techniques uh, for any uh, quantum hardware platform that's available out there. Um, so yeah, I, I'm of course very happy to have seen that happen. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a validation of the work I did uh, quite a while ago. Uh, I've been uh, working uh, mostly in the area of uh, what's, what's called quantum game theory. Uh, it's where you try to figure out how to optimize quantum information processes uh, using game theoretic considerations. Uh, game theory is something that has been used uh, in the past for several things. Uh, one of them was in politics and, uh, you know, during the Cold War, uh, this is something Colonel Joe Booker perhaps may wish to, <laughs> uh, you know, talk about it some, uh, later in the, in, the, in the conversation. Um, and um, the, the um, benefits there are, of course, you know, my, my main goal there was to look at how you can actually optimize quantum technology or its use uh, in, in uh, areas beyond, you know, the quantum ecosystem, uh, if you will. And, and see how you can uh, see benefits coming out. So for instance, you know, how can you apply it to, uh, you know, quantum technology and then apply the quantum technology to say uh, economics, right? High frequency trading or financial systems like that uh, to see some kind of benefit. So that's what I've been working on. With respect to the quantum city idea that you mentioned, uh, this goes back to the work I was doing at Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi where um, I was part of a group, I was leading a group which actually was able to implement a small quantum enabled network uh, within the university. And in a way it was kind of our first step towards a quantum internet, right? Uh, now the quantum internet proper is several years away. Uh, if you follow the information in the news, um, you'll be happy to see that it's actually progressing quite nicely. So. Uh, I'm hopeful that within five years, you'll have something like that at a much larger level. But uh, about five or six years ago, we implemented something uh, of a local quantum network at Khalifa University. Uh, the goal was to sort of, you know, enlarge that to, to a uh, quantum technology, quantum communication network for the UAE. Uh, and I'm really happy to see that uh, in Abu Dhabi in particular these days, uh, in fact, I think it was announced this year, earlier this year, there's an effort ongoing to develop an indigenous quantum computer, right, at, uh, in Abu Dhabi, at an institute in Abu Dhabi. So that's great news and uh, kind of further validates the work I was, you know, doing several years ago in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and uh, goal, of course, now for me at Dark Star is to see how we can work uh, towards establishing a proper quantum city. Uh, of course, the idea was that it would be in Las Vegas. <laughs> Uh, for several reasons that have to do with you know, the facilities that the government of Nevada is providing. So um, I think that's probably a good enough introduction for now. And we can, of course, get back into that uh, later. Uh, Dave, back to you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. I kind of like how one of your glasses seems darker than the other. So you're <laughs> almost like a Captain Bly look there. Okay, I'll move forward a little bit. No, no, I like it. I like it. It's got it's got a great look to that. Uh, it goes with your booming voice, uh, Fassel. Uh, and I see a uh, shout out to the quantum kid, uh, Aaron, uh, who is here. He's the, he's, I mentor uh, Aaron, and he's created a group of youth who are very excited about uh, Dark Star. It happens every, every Friday. And I see the youth have, have followed us to the meetup. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, but they were here for our previous meetup which also featured uh, uh, Colonel Bookard as a, as a guest. Uh, so it's nice uh, to see this energetic group. I'd also like to recognize uh, Elena. Uh, Elena uh, is a penetration uh, tester 
and we have her, we're looking to Lena and her company uh, to do the penetration testing for quantum and that we are, we are claiming security. So a professional quantum, uh, sorry, a professional uh, pen testing organization uh, would be something that would uh, behoove us. And I've worked with Elena uh, for a couple of years actually uh, to get ready for this project. So there's some deep background effort uh, involved uh, in, in this meetup. Uh, and this is the, the pinnacle. Uh, I'd also like to recognize uh, Vera, if I had not done so before, our media uh, director. This video has been recorded. It'll be professionally edited and found on our, our YouTube uh, our YouTube page. Uh, and uh, Vera is also the mom uh, of, of Aaron, the, the quantum kid. Uh, now, uh, we had put out uh, a press release uh, that spoke uh, to Greek gods. And I'm going to bring you back for, for a moment, Fassel, uh, to appreciate uh, this because it's, it's your work that has caused us to be uh, Athena-like. So let me just share the screen here. Uh, and uh, do we have actually, we don't have the Athena here. Oh, right. Well, what I'll, what I'll do here is I'll just mention uh, that the meetup name is Dark Star Organizing the Quantum Technology Ecosystem uh, for Defense and Space. And uh, Colonel Booker and I were just chit-chatting with the rest of the leadership group prior to 11 o'clock about this his interests. We will get into Colonel Booker's background. Uh, he's representing all six of, of the uh, DOD branches, uh, which include the, the Space Force, uh, something uh, that is, is exciting. Uh, and we'll be talking more about that uh, as time permits, uh, and, and especially on future meetups. But with that said, uh, what I'll just do is turn to you, uh, Fassel, uh, to talk about how uh, you had uh, brought up and we had used the Athena uh, as, a, as a theme. Uh, back to you, Dr. Khan. Wonderful. Thank you, Dave. Yes. So, so uh, what actually happened was that our CEO, uh, Mr. David Wilkinson, uh, was talking about how Dark Star seems to have come along, uh, not seems, has definitely come along a, a long way. Uh, since you know the three of us got together last year in October, and uh, we've got a pretty mature product line, uh, which is you know broadly applicable to different uh, you know application domains and so forth, uh, and that kind of brought to my mind the story of Athena, the ancient Greek goddess who was formed fully uh, grown uh, from the head of her father Zeus, the king of gods, right. And um, it seemed to me like that was a, a very apt comparison for Dark Star, where you know Dark Star was formed, kind of fully formed, <laughs> right? Put together, fully formed, uh, in a short seven months. Whereas uh, you know, compared to other startup companies, certainly in the quantum ecosystem, uh, it's it can be a fairly prolonged and uh, relatively painful process. So I think it's a testament to the team, uh, you know, the founding team uh, that has come together. And has been able to work together so nicely, you know, bring together unique abilities uh, that has led to that, you know. So uh, let me just finish by saying that uh, Dark Star is the Athena of the quantum realm. <laughs> oh, such uh, such sweet words, uh, uh, Dr. Khan. Uh, and it's because of your background uh, that uh, we feel honored. Uh, that you would uh, describe us as that, even though you're describing yourself, it still feels uh, honorable. Uh, we are experts in our, in our own domain uh, with, with Fassel, who I headhunted uh, from Khalifa University uh, as the best uh, executive type of academic, a PhD with a broad background uh, in such technologies as QRNG, which is quantum random number generation, part of our quantum garage approach, uh, where uh, we, uh, just like uh, a gentleman by the name of Steve Jobs, uh, created a garage and used off the shelf tools and existing technology put together in a clever way 
to produce outstanding functionality at a cost-effective price. Uh, and that's part of our theme. Uh, we'll be getting more into that uh, in context. Now, we uh, have a product line roadmap, uh, as uh, Dr. Khan had mentioned, where I am a project manager and we've been working on, on these projects. We've had previous meetups where we've demonstrated the hardware and we'll be talking about uh, the dark leaf as, as part of that. Uh, as, we, as we continue with the uh, preamble uh, as the sponsor, it would behoove us uh, to share uh, at least our excitement uh, around our full product map or the uh, perhaps the financial product map and the defense product map relevant uh, to Colonel Booker's interest for defense and space. But as, as uh, financial was mentioned, uh, we can uh, share that as well. The two are closely related. In fact, uh, it is our belief that by working with the defense department uh, just as the internet uh, was born out of ARPA, uh, which came from DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, and look at the trillions of dollars that have been generated from that. This is doing it again, but at the quantum level. And in this way, we are looking to empower the Defense Department and empower their creativity that we'll learn about from Colonel Bookard. But the excitement uh, of looking up and seeing satellites uh, intersect with the Space Force and use that to create an exciting new economy where proudly with the Defense Department we support and are able for this goodness uh, to spread across the land globally. And so it is with great pleasure that I bring back our CEO, Mr. Wilkinson, to talk about the product uh, line and and David you can let me know uh, which product line you want me to start with either fintech item 1.1 or 1.3 uh, de defense what would you like me to share first start with the uh the fintech that's that's fine um, I, I just want to kind of take a step back from things and, and give a little bit more context about kind of what our product roadmap is and how we uh how we kind of arrived at Deciding this, this, this is what all is going to go on there. I'm getting a little bit of echo there. Um, it's fine. Okay. Um, so we really have two kind of overarching themes with uh, that are that are consistent throughout our product roadmap. Um, they're all kind of uh, everything that we will uh, be doing in the, in this kind of first uh, phase of the business is uh, falls under one of uh, two larger umbrellas, which is an application, as Dr. Fassel said, uh, of quantum randomness or is more of a kind of algorithmic approach to applying the quantum computing hardware uh, to solve some kind of uh, an optimization problem. So that's, uh, you can kind of break down uh, every single one of our products into one box or the other, or some combination of the two, ideally. Um, all, of, all of the applications that we've identified uh, in the FinTech market is, uh, they, they all are, uh, again, either one of these two kind of overarching um, thematic applications. Uh, we have Cambit, which is, uh, um, which is, which is, is really... Uh, oh, I see, I, item 3.1 uh, uh, down. down. Yes. Yeah, I can, I can see it there, thank you. So if you, if I'll you just highlight it for everyone to be able to see. Right, so Cam Cambit is uh, an application of quantum randomness uh, that we use to model high frequency trading. So uh, for example, cryptocurrency is, uh, is becoming a, one of, a, you know, a hot topic in the news these days. Um, th this, this application can actually be used by financial institutions to automate their trading process and create uh, significantly larger returns uh, based on a risk arbitrage of what, what trade gives you the optimal outcome. Uh, in this way, Cambit uh, is, is one of our lead, uh, leading products that we've decided, uh, we've, we've identified as, as 
uh, you know, really being high value and one that we need to uh, prioritize despite our kind of overall uh, MO, which is more kind of aligned to the defense space. Um, beyond that, Sentinel, uh, which is uh, the integration of our dark leaf product into a smartphone or smart device, um, wireless communication device. Uh, this is this is an, an example of quantum security. So all, all you know, uh, the quantum randomness products that we have all take advantage of this of this uh, unique property to create a, an additional layer of encryption that is the only truly unhackable um, method of of security protocol that we will kind of have in our arsenal going forward uh, with with all of the kind of advents of quantum computing being right around the corner. Um, so a lot of people are, you know, will we'll say, okay, well, we've got the blockchain and the blockchain, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay because we have blockchain. Um, actually, blockchains need to be protected as well, um, not only at the software level, but also at the hardware level. So, uh, which is why we created the dark coin, which is a, uh, a, a digital asset that uh, could be offered by, uh, for example, a bank um, or financial institution that wanted to offer a cryptocurrency, uh, wanted to create a cryptocurrency. So uh, we would, would sell that service as well. Um, and beyond that, there are other applications of the, the blockchain, uh, which is uh, our 3.4, our, our fourth product there, uh, which you know, uh, extend from the energy space to, um, you know, a variety of other applications that, that uh, we are going to develop further going forward. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the general uh, take on the FinTech suite, the FinTech all being, you know, it, uh, as we said, either a security uh, randomness based ap application or some kind of a optimization like risk arbitrage or, or derivatives pricing. Uh, Dave, could you advance the, the next slide, please? Yeah, yes. Uh, and just before we do, for those who are watching from, from a phone and perhaps have difficulty in seeing the screen, I'll just go from the top left hand corner, from the top down to the bottom. Uh, this is infographic A, uh, where we have Treasury, Commerce Department, OMB, that's the Office of Management and, uh, and uh, Budget. Uh, this is item 1.1. So as your project manager, uh, we use uh, numbers, work breakdown structure, so that we can have a completely organized uh, and easy to, uh, easy to translate a set of projects. Start from this project page, and we'll hear more about the detail from Dr. Faisal Shah Khan as he is our product manager. He can go into the the detail that we see here, but just at the high level, uh, we call this FinTech. Well, so this is sorry, 1.1 FinTech Solution Roadmap. And we call this FinTech with the Q, the quantum of finance. And item number one is the dark leaf, as David mentioned. And this is a hybrid classical quantum circuit, a piece of hardware. And as David mentioned, uh, this dark leaf goes into the products, for example, number two. Number two is called Crone. And Crone uh, is, is the uh, dark leaf found into the drone. And we also have FinTech, which David then shared, uh, followed by the quantum algorithmic solutions, which we'll get into uh, a detail. What I think maybe we should uh, do, David, uh, as it's now 1124, uh, is to hold off on the introduction of the second infographic, the defense in space, and perhaps uh, would be good to introduce our, our main speaker, uh, Colonel Bookard. Uh, would that be okay? I think you're right. Let's do that. Okay, uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Colonel Bookard. And we just stop the share here. Now, uh, Colonel uh, Joe D. Booker of the U.S. Army is the U.S. Army 7th Director, Army Rapid uh, Force. And 
in this role, the colonel served uh, as the U.S. Army's quick reaction capability lead to validate Army requirements. So it's quite exciting uh, that uh, the colonel uh, is leading quantum for the DOD across the six branches. Now, the background there includes identifying, procuring, and delivering emerging technologies, for example, quantum, in counter unmanned aerial systems, unmanned autonomous systems, dismounted electronic warfare, and mission command and control systems to meet operational demands supporting globally employed by uh, Army forces. And part of the background, the illustrious background of Colonel Booker, prior to his assignment, Colonel Booker served as the 428th Field Art Artillery Brigade Commander Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and previously served as the Executive Officer to the Director of the Joint and Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization, uh, J-I-E-D-D-O, where I kind of see Jedi in there. It's very exciting for me. Uh, Office of the Under Secretary of Defense Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Uh, the good Colonel is a graduate of the South Carolina State University, served as a field artillery officer at all levels to include command of the 3rd Battalion, 321st Field Artillery Regiment, 18th Fire Brigade Airborne, and key staff positions in the 2nd Infancy Infantry Division, 3D Infantry Division, 2D Armored Cavalry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division, and the XVIII Airborne Corps. I should be able to translate Roman numeral. I'm not going to try. His operational deployments include Operation Enduring Freedom, Unified Response, uh, and the awards include the Legion of Merit, Bronze Star Medal, and the Defense Mer Meritorious Service Medal. He was awarded the Combat Action Badge, the Master Parachutist Badge, the Air Assault Badge, and various foreign parachutist badges. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got uh, Colonel uh, Booker here, uh, which I think in, in my mind rivals uh, G.I. Joe an action figure uh, that was from my youth. I think we've got the real deal here. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Colonel Booker. Wow, you know, sometimes when I hear that bio, you know, that military bio, it, it always amazes me about, you know, who's that guy, he's, you know, they're talking about. Uh, and, and ironically, you never put all the information on the military bio. So we really could add a lot more things on there. But, uh, but Dave, thanks again for that warm introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilkerson and uh, Dr. Faisal uh, Khan for inviting me here today to uh, provide remarks on where quantum can support our problem solving for some of the greatest military challenges. So before I go on, I would like to say is that um, I'm an Army officer, active duty Army officer, and I represent Army equity. So although Dave mentioned, you know, I'm leading the Army's efforts for quantum, um, there is an organization that's leading that. Where I fit in with the Army equity is that I've had the ability serving in a previous role as the Army's Rapid Equipment Forces to identify emerging technologies. So what do we mean by, you know, those emerging technologies? But before I jump into that, I just want to give a, a, a quick summary of what Dave described to me so I can set the stage really for, for why is this guy who's a non-physicist and, and a mathematician, you know, speaking to you about quantum. So as the role of the director of the Army's Rapid Equipment Force, I had the opportunity to identify either uh, to develop, prototype, or procure emerging technologies, and then deliver those technologies to the operational, to fulfill operational demands across our, our global employed forces. So what does that mean in, in regular words? So if there was a good idea, you know, great concept from whether that was a small, you know, you know startup organization or, or one as large as one of the big industries industry group organizations that could solve a, a cross domain challenge such as an unmanned aerial system or a counter unmanned aerial system 
a forces protection system or just simply, you know, communication. I had the ability to rapidly procure, develop, do additive manufacturing, then deliver that, you know, to, in the hands of the warfighter. And I did it all within 180 days. So imagine, you know, what we're talking in terms of quantum, some of those entities will not happen within 180 days. However, what I would say is that, you know, what we know about quantum and with, um, you know, the your quantum ecosystem, you know, having laid the foundation for quantum computing over the last 30 years, I think it's time now for you to bring some of your emerging quantum processing technologies in your research laboratories, in your garages, into the open. So in order to have a dialogue, you know, with the defense, um, you know, in order to have a dialogue with the defense uh, emerging technologists like myself, and really, I'm here to help bridge that, um, you know, that challenge of, of what you've been working on in these research uh, laboratories and operationalize that um, so those pursuits can fit neatly within our defense and space and even inside our medical quantum ecosystems, you know, which you guys are working on. So is I can't tell if the next slide is up, you know, at least the agenda. Joe, would you like me to uh, bring yes. up the uh, yep. first slide there? One yes, moment. please. Yes, so again, you're probably thinking, what kind of non-quantum physicist, you know, or, or mathematician, you know, tell you about quantum? I, I, I joke, I laugh at myself as well, you know, but I do have an you know, innate ability to be able to uh, uh, look beyond, you know, the, the next horizon. So that's what emerging technology, you know, really is for me, you know, when I, you know, identify things that could have uh, great potential immediately or with some seed corn money, you know, we call initial investments is to get it going to meet an operational challenge. So um, again, I'm not here to tell you about the three properties, entanglement, superpositioning, or coherence. You have Dave, uh, Dr. Wilkinson and Dr. Khan, you know, to help shape that and many others to have that conversation with you. But really, I'm here is to lay out, you know, some defense challenges and areas where your research can intersect to provide quantum solutions. I say it cleanly just like that, is to help operationalize some of the work, some of the research you've been doing, um, and how that intersects with the defense challenges and where we can see you know, a partnership you know, can exist. So I'll just cover you know, just a few things here that's outlined on the discussion topics. <clears throat> uh, Dave, if you would advance to the next slide, please, and we'll just go back to this one as well. So this particular document isn't as busy as some of our traditional uh, military um, you know, briefs, but I wanted to uh, at least lay out to you um, uh, how we perceive uh, the quantum information, how quantum information science uh, can enable warfighting challenges. Again, the Pentagon envisions uh, the future battlefield as an interconnected web of sensors that pass data to warfighters combined with a myriad of emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence, mesh networks, advanced waveforms, and secure digital tools, you know, that allow commanders to make decisions fast. So we need advanced data analytics on the battlefield beyond line of sight communications with high bandwidth if satellite communications is unavailable requiring a commander such as myself not to go back to the analyst to determine what's coming off of one of the data feeds. So what we're seeing here is, you know, at the top, there's a quantum cloud for secured information and computing. Uh, we have a uh, secured comms between the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Uh, we have uh, inertial sensors for assured position of global positioning and targeting. We have mass sensors for detection and mapping and fibers linked to fix uh, quantum networks. Also, you know, there'll be enhanced resolution um, and ultra wide band uh, with fused multi band radars to help communicate and help sense and help aid us to, uh, in, 
you know, really understand the sense making from what we've just discovered. So when we think about information science enabling uh, warfighter capabilities, you know, our skills in the military, you know, we need experts within um, the best fields within uh, academia, the industry, or even, you know, from um, a person who has a, you know, an invested interest in, in bettering um, uh, national security, you know, who's a, you know, a strong supporter of quantum and understands quantum, who's, who's credentialed in quantum information science, you know, to help us solve some of these compact complex challenges. Because again, when we're envisioning the Pentagon, um, we envision, a, you know, the future battlefield as being interconnected web of sensors. So although this is a schematic, in some areas today, we're operating in this regard. And we call that, uh, that connection of information, we call that connection of information, the joint all domain command and control uh, network. JAD C2. For all of you on the meetup this morning, you know, I could, you know, I'm not a betting man, but I would say there's over a 99% chance that the country you're in is either partnered, you know, they're even developing or considering the development of some type of joint all domain command control uh, network so we can all communicate globally. If you're not heard of this term, you know, again, I'm sure your countries are working on this effort, but the JADC2 is a concept to connect those sensors and, and effectors uh, from all of the military services. As I mentioned, the secure comms between the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, and the Marine Corps, and the Space Force into one single network. So although that network has not been clearly defined yet, we're still working through that process to identify you know, the communication pipe or thread, you know, that will uh, push that data down to the warfighter. However, we do know with the interconnectedness of all of these networks, the legacy way of, commu of computing will not be enough. So what's next? How can we, uh, again, press forward by using the quantum information science in terms of uh, securing our comms, quantum clouds for secure information sharing and computing, inertial sensors for sure global positioning and uh, targeting. So Dave, if you, you know, this, we'll leave that here for a second. Um, it's okay if there are some questions that's coming up on, on, I guess in the chat, I can answer those questions or would you like me to hold off here and, you know, and have folks ask questions as we move on? Oh, thank you for asking here. So I'm just looking at the chat here. Uh, so we have uh, Dev uh, Dot Sharma, excellent and welcome, uh, India. Well, I like that, and I'm from India. <laughs> uh, so Joe, uh, this speaks uh, to so your message is being conveyed, uh, and this is a global effort, uh, and uh, we're pleased uh, to to see that. Uh, those are the the comments that I that I see uh, right now in chat, and uh, I have some some comments as 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 well, and I would open up uh, to our subject matter expert, uh, Dr. Faisal Shah Khan, who has uh, prepared a, a little presentation uh, to answer the question of what's next, and as a practical mechanism of how to go from where you are right now uh, into greater computational abilities which is one of the uh, requests that you have. So we've created a, a mechanism to step up uh, to bridge the gap. And I would uh, I mention here uh, that the interconnected web, uh, one of the uh, issues, uh, and as a project manager, I can tell you that uh, information overload, uh, when uh, I manage projects and there's too much data, what do you do? Uh, we'll get into more details uh, later about that. But what's nice is a quantum inspired approach can also deal with information overload and make it consumable uh, for the uh, person who is looking to consume it uh, using the equipment that they're using. So a common sense, a natural approach uh, that could work uh, for a stressed person uh, looking for just information. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, 
uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Faisal Shah Khan. Uh, now, Faisal, uh, you mentioned uh, you have a presentation as, as well. And when you want to uh, share that, I'll just stop my share uh, for you to then uh, your share. Please take it away, Faisal. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, I, I'll just be talking about it. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, Colonel Booker, uh, this is amazing. I mean, your your uh, presentation, the, your discussion so far was, of course, very uh, you know enlightening. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at the slide here, uh, which is just a you know a, a, a massive network of communication, right? And uh, your question is right there. Uh, you know, how does quantum information science enable, uh, you know, uh, defense and space related capabilities? Um, so, so to, to speak of, uh, to speak towards to, to the idea, to the notion of information overload that you also brought up and then Dave also mentioned just now, uh, the, the notion of quantum computing and, and or, or high performance computing comes up, right? And so the question becomes, what is high performance computing, right? So traditionally, or, or what we call conventional technology, computing technology has been, you know, what's been around since the 1940s, uh, which was developed in the 1940s, right? Electronic computing uh, and has progressed to the stage where we now have, uh, you know, personal computers and of course, you know, high performance supercomputers, uh, which can do trillions of calculations per second. Um, and they also have, you know, the right kind of, hardware that allows you to put together the right kind of software to, you know, further increase computational abilities. Now, um, as Colonel Booker said, that still seems to be not enough, right? There's, there's evidence from the field from the, from the, uh, you know, in the defense and space industry that that's uh, insufficient. So that's what quantum computing has been all about. Uh, you know, when it was first, uh, introduced in the 1980s, you could say, arguably. Uh, and, um, you know, plenty of theoretical results were given, which kind of, you know, established uh, mathematically that yes, once we have quantum computers, uh, proper quantum computers, there'll be all this, uh, you know, quick processing of information uh, that can be done that would be able to, uh, one, one would be able to do, and, you know, with, with you know, provable benefits. So are we there yet in terms of quantum computing? Uh, not really, right? We are in the first generation of quantum computing processors. And uh, it's a good step forward because it, it allows us to actually test things, right? Uh, it's one thing to have theoretical results. It's totally another thing to figure out, to, to implement those results and see, you know, what um, the theory may have missed in, in terms of practical implementation. So we've got, you know, lots of quantum computing platforms uh, commercially available right now in their first generation. <clears throat> we have uh, gate-based computing from uh, companies like IonQ. Um, Honeywell's working on uh, some of that stuff. Uh, IBM, of course, has, uh, you know, a quantum processor of the same type. Uh, we have quantum annealing from D-Wave, uh, which is available. Um, but what's more interesting to me is the uh, fact that, you know, going from conventional technology, computing technology to the next level, uh, people seem to have jumped over something in between, right? And that something in between is digital annealing, right? This is what we call a quantum inspired uh, technology. So the idea is that, you know, you have um, input coming from for de developers of the first generation of quantum processors. And you're saying, well, they're having difficulty, you know, making improvements further beyond the first generation of these processors for you know reasons that people are still trying to figure out. Uh, can we get some inspiration from what they have and do something about it uh, in the meantime by using something in between, right, of what we have had and what quantum is trying to achieve. Uh, so this is where digital annealing comes, uh, you know, uh, comes up. And this is something I was involved uh, in with a pro in a with respect to a project uh, last year uh, when I was at Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi. And the project had to do with uh, figuring out arbitrage opportunity uh, in, uh, in certain markets. Uh, and uh, the performance was quite impressive actually of the digital annealer. And the one that we used, and I think that's the only one available in the market is from uh, Fujitsu, uh, the Japanese company Fujitsu. And uh, 
it, it you know it, it gives good results um, which is all one can ask for right now uh, because compared to quantum computers they're not exactly giving you know delivering on the promise that was made theoretically um, so you know there's more work to be done on the quantum side but one other advantage there of course is that you know you have um, this idea that you are looking at the quantum ecosystem right what the quantum computing developers are doing and kind of taking ideas from there and going beyond the quantum ecosystem this is something that uh, colonel booker and i have uh, you know spoken of several times uh, in in other conversations and i, I really like that idea and, and hopefully colonel booker can uh, speak to that a little bit later but it's uh, in my opinion a very important idea because you, you, you're taking some, you, you have this high, you know, ideal that, you know, you'll have these quantum computers that will deliver on this, these remarkable promises, like, you know, breaking cryptography instantly like that. But we're not there yet. And we won't be for a while if, if you, you know, look at the trends. Uh, but we can do something in between, right? Move away from the ecosystem of, of quantum computing, quantum technologies, and see how we can take ideas from there and apply them somewhere in the middle, right? And of course, the question would be, can something like that be used for, for what Colonel Booker is talking about? And um, my, my conclusion would be, of course, absolutely, right? We just have to test it. And, and Dr. Khan, okay. uh, if I may add to that, uh, the, the, uh, as the question here is in terms of uh, navigation, uh, sorry, uh, precision, position, navigation and timing, PNT uh, capability, I'm uh, excited to uh, share the uh, the dark shield uh, project map uh, that you have or instrumental in assembling. Uh, perhaps uh, now that we uh, briefly talked about where David introduced uh, quantum random number generation chips, QRNG chip bottom, uh, there's in the middle digital annealing, uh, which is an extension of classical computing enhanced by quantum inspiration. At the top we have quantum computing. We have a layered approach here. And by cleverly using the layered approach, uh, we're able to assemble a product line. I would like to also mention that Dr. Khan experience with digital annealing, uh, working with a digital annealer company, as well as with quantum computing, for example, D which has recognized Dr. Khan's prowess uh, in being able to uh, deploy that. Uh, would now be a good time, uh, Dr. Khan, to share the infographic for context, uh, the uh, dark shield? Certainly, let's do that. Okay, and uh, I, I note that we have JAD C2, Joint All Domain and Control. We'll see uh, the same here on our, our slide, uh, item 1.3. Uh, please uh, take it away, Dr. Khan. Thank you, Dave, yes. So this is a, a, a similar infographic as uh, to the one that was uh, you know, uh, presented earlier and David talked about. Um, the idea is that you know, we, we have you know, identified what, what I like to call the two strokes of the quantum technology engine, right? And those two strokes David referred to as well. Uh, one is that of uh, quantum randomness, you know, getting higher order of randomness from quantum sources, right? Uh, this is what gives rise to quantum random number generation, as David Dave said. Uh, the other stroke is the quantum computing, uh, which is the, in a sense, you could say it's uh, the opposite of what quantum randomness does, right? You're in fact trying to put control on quantum randomness and get access to these uh, features like entanglement and coherence that uh, Colonel Booker mentioned earlier. Um, and um, those two, uh, because those two are the fundamental strokes of quantum technology, at least today or in the foreseeable future, you will see quite a lot of, uh, you know, a uh, lot of them anywhere in any kind of product line. Uh, what what you're looking for there then is a creative way to figure out application domains for these two technology engines, uh, strokes of the technology engine, quantum technology engine. And that's why you'll see that most of these infographics are similar looking, but they have um, you know dramatic implications for the application domain you have in mind. 
So for instance, here we have dark shield, uh, what we're calling the quantum of defense. Um, here we have something called the dark leaf. Uh, this, this is what you could imagine as um, a, um, uh, um, a quantum randomness generating chip, right? Together with the appropriate um, uh, microcode, the, the code that'll allow you to take this quantum chip and interface it with a existing piece of, you know, a conventional technology like a mobile phone or, or whatever you might think of, could be your PC, right? And uh, putting them together is a challenge because you need to make sure that when these two technologies connect, the quantumness of the quantum technology doesn't vanish, right? Doesn't get depleted. So, so that's where the dark leaf comes into play. It makes sure that that does not happen. Um, this could be, you know, put inside a, a drone, for example, right? Uh, this is uh, the notion of what we call the crone, uh, which is number two, circle number two here. And, uh, you know, if, if this uh, could be put inside, this chip could be put inside a, a conventional drone, right? Uh, perhaps used by the armed forces or, or some, some other, you know, uh, um, uh, company that has some other reasons for using drones, you can enable uh, things like, you know, unhackable security inside that drone, right? So, so this crone will be something that uh, will have the ability to be not hacked, right? In particular, if you think in, think in terms of uh, uh, drone swarms, right? For whatever positive reason, uh, you know, watching too many Hollywood video uh, movies, you, you can sort of, uh, relate to the fact that somebody might come up with the notion of a suicide drone swarm, right? Um, and and uh, they, they can actually do it by hacking into some some regular uh, drone swarm. So you want to make sure that your drones are, are unhackable. And so this quantum security layer that you add onto your drones uh, using Darkleaf uh, provides that. Um, Dave, uh, is that, I think, sufficient at the moment? Yes. Uh, hey, Joe Booker. Yes, sir. Booker. Yeah, hey, you know, what a great um, lay down of, of really your product roadmap um, in terms of, um, uh, I guess, defense equities. So I can see, you know, whether or not the, the Chrome number two and your number three, most times we think about the defense, you know, U.S. defense or defense in space in a kinetic, in a lethal way. But even in a non-lethal way, you know, we think about, you know, those same types of, you know, you know, swarms, you know, drone swarms, you know, or multi um, node drones that are using multiple connection points to communicate, but they're providing uh, global logistics, a global sustainment supply, the client resupply. So that, you know, um, GPS denied um drone can still operate if I'm understanding what you're communicating with the products that you could provide. Yes, uh, so uh, if, if this is to uh, speak to the idea that, uh, you know, the, the drone has um, been hacked, is that uh, the idea when you said GPS denied? Yes, so, um, so at times there's not a signal, as you know, it, I don't have to explain it, you know, to this group here, but at times there's not a signal that you will receive to have the, you know, the drone or the hardware to be uh, activated or really, you know, to self-locate. So that's, you know, so how do you secure that, you know, the network? So when the GPS signal is, you know, jammed or there's no GPS signal, you know, how does it still communicate? So I think what I heard you say is that, um, you know, your product allows that security, you know, over the drones, you know, circuitry to allow it to still uh, communicate, you know, with the server. Right, uh, exactly. So, so uh, certainly that, what you just said, uh, Colonel Booker, is exactly the idea, but I think the way you can make that enable this technology is supposed to work is that it allows, uh, it prevents the, for example, going to the idea of jamming, right? If your technology can prevent that jamming from occurring, uh, you know, that that would be a big step towards 
making sure that the drone is you know still part of your communication network so certainly that is the case with qrng technology uh there is something called quantum sensing uh which is uh you know um, which has been around for a while the idea is that how do we use the uh, extreme sensitivity of quantum objects to you know to 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 noise or environment that they're surrounded by right so what they do is basically they they decohere right as you were saying they lose their quantum properties and so and they do it very quickly in a very sensitive way so what that allows you to do is to come up with a very sensitive um, sensor right uh, for of, of you know noise in your system so the idea is that if your drone has that capability uh, utilized uh, based on the quantum chip and dark leaf inside, then you are preventing, uh, for example, the jamming of the drone rate because you have the ability to detect any sort of, you know, what you can classify as a very, uh, you, you can set up a very strong and robust threshold for what noise should be considered, right? What, what kind of interference should be considered as noise. With that in mind, you can reset, you can calibrate your drone to reset uh, at the slightest you know, um, indication of noise in your system. So that would be what you could say is a anti-jamming capability uh, of your crone uh, using this technology. Yeah, awesome. I appreciate the, that description. That fits, you know, as we talked, uh, as I described earlier about the, the joint all domain command and control network, the JADC2, you know, where it's the quantum cloud you know, for secure information sharing. So, yeah, I'd like to explore more about that. Absolutely, yeah. So, so uh, of course, we can do that in a, in a, in a separate conversation as well. But uh, to just you know maybe wrap up here really quickly, uh, you know the the infographic that you had, Colonel Booker, uh, everywhere where it's there's a there's a little you know edge connecting two objects, right? Uh, I'm thinking of those as a network, and uh, those networks can be quantum enabled in all sorts of ways, right? Uh, certainly in terms of anti-jamming, right? Uh, that idea comes up, right? So there's a satellite uh, with a ray coming out into a drone I see in this picture. How do I prevent that from uh, going away, right? Being jammed. So, so quantum sensing, um, quantum random number generator technology can certainly you know, mitigate that. I would like to to add to that, uh, and one of the one of the advantages and dangers of these meetups uh, are the are the questions, uh, which we love. Uh, and for example, uh, Elena, uh, our security officer, has some questions, and we'll we'll ask her that in a moment. What I wanted to point out, though, I wanted to introduce a, a term here uh, for the first time. We haven't even spoken about this. Uh, in the in the past, but it occurred to me as I was listening to Colonel Booker and Dr. Khan speak, which is the quant we've heard of the superhighway, the information superhighway, where in the past, prior to the internet, there was not a roadway, there was not a, a method for data to go back and forth. And then when the internet was born, there was the information superhighly created. And I would suggest from looking at this diagram uh, that there's a need for connectivity, uh, a, a need for a super highway. And uh, uh, Dr. Khan, uh, can I give you the honors of, of, uh, of coining this term? I think you know where I'm going, hint, hint. Um, are we talking about the quantum information super highway? <laughs> Thank you for coining the, the term. Uh, Dr. Khan has coined all our terms. Uh, he's a bit of a subject matter expert uh, and a scientist poet. Uh, so thank you for that since inspiration came from you. What I'm suggesting here, and we'll look to you, Dr. Khan, to validate live and to critique uh, my, my thinking here, is a quantum superhighway can be created where currently there is none. Currently there is contested information sharing uh, for a number of reasons. And what I'm suggesting is we put a, a dark leaf that has the QRNG baby chips, uh, baby quantum chip, uh, a term that comes from, from Aaron the Quantum Kid. He actually has a comic strip about this. 
if one of our baby quantum chips are put into our printed circuit board PCB, and we have uh, Sharanya, who is our PCB expert, uh, creating uh, robotics uh, from our board technology. If we put one in the satellite, and if we put one in this drone, a quantum drone, a crone, what I'm suggesting is that there's two devices where we can create a quantum super information highway. So I will put that to you, uh, uh, Dr. Khan, as both the product manager, as well as our quantum information scientist uh, to find a way of between the low QRNG chips, uh, which you happen to have like 20 or 30 of those chips uh, sitting on your desk at the moment, uh, including your background with digital annealing, uh, which is an extension of, of current high-speed computing. Why? Because it's quantum inspired and also include at the high end, the standard quantum computing machines, which are very expensive, but are available over the cloud that by, by cleverly putting together these three layers that we're able to in the dark leaf, in the dark box, uh, which is our software box, Mr. Wilkinson oversees uh, as a software expert for the DOD, the Platform One, and other products, uh, which Mr. Wilkinson might speak to later on. I believe that we're able to create the super unhackable quantum super highway between these devices. Now in making a statement like that, unhackable, I am not one who ever makes statements which are absolute. I don't believe in that. I always believe that it can be so this is where I'm thinking you, the audience, might hear me say that and question that. Uh, so I am still being educated on the one person in our group who understand these things and have done this. Uh, and we will be turning to Elena, uh, who, who may have some questions about it. But first, Dr. Khan, could you explain uh, why this quantum random number generation QRNG chips provides this feature that makes any device it's fitted to, which we uh, are suggesting to be done in the dark leaf, it becomes now an unhackable electronic device. Dr. Khan. Certainly. So let me qualify, first of all, that uh, the unhackable, uh, a better word is provably secure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, provable security means, in principle, it basically means that um, you know, in principle, in theory, uh, you know, based on the, the principles and theory of quantum mechanics as understood, um, and we understand, you know, it quite well. Uh, we've understood this for a while now. Uh, a, a communication channel, which is protected with quantum uh, randomness source, uh, will always be leaving no data behind. So since there's no, sorry, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, we'll be leaving no patterns in the in the data that's you know uh, coming back and forth, uh, you know into into that device. So if there's no pattern to the data, then no amount of clever hacking or or frequency analysis will really reveal anything, right? There's just no pattern in there. Uh, so that's why they say it's provably secure. Now, whether that can be faithfully implemented in technology is always a question, right? Uh, your, your theory is only as good as, you know, how, how it's practically Im implemented. Now, uh, again, uh, people have gotten really good at this, uh, you know, um, and, and, you know, we, we can speak to uh, NIST standards. The NIST standards are the, the ones set up by NIST, uh, the National Institute of Science uh, of Standards and um, in Technology. I, I beg, I, don't take my word for it. Please look up NIST. I forget what it stands for. It's an American institution that takes, you know, puts out these standards for for uh, technological uh, for technologies basically. So uh, certain quantum chips that produce QRNG uh, features uh, pass those tests, right? So they're pretty good, you know, as good as the you know best standards out there. Can they be improved? Sure, they, they probably you know there's always room for improvement, right? And of course, the question then becomes, you know, and we can take this back to Colonel Booker, are those standards stringent enough to be, you know, applicable in 
space, defense in space, right? Are they the same standards or are the standards going to require more tightening uh, for the space and defense industries? So, so that's kind of the idea that, you know, this is how uh, you, you uh, secure your, your uh, data or, or your, the object that you put a quantum chip in. Uh, it's basically giving off zero or very minimal patterns in your data processing. Dave, um, does that address your question? Suitably? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we have the comment from a Colonel Booker uh, of no network in uh, That's right. So please, please, uh, please speak to that. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, Colonel, uh, would you like to please jump in? Yeah, you described that, you know, I just used the DOD term, what you just described is the same way. So as we go through our process, it's just simply no network intrusions. Right. So uh, this would be now uh, saying that uh, you uh, just kind of, you know, thinking in, from my point of view, this would be saying that you have two devices which are, you know, equipped with dark leaf, you know, it has this QRNG technology built in uh, to those two devices. And all the communication between those two can in principle happen on a regular network. It doesn't have to be quantum uh, enabled because you know that's gonna be a few years away. Uh, nonetheless, you, know, you have this ability to still detect intrusion happening on that network because every time you send patternless data across this you know, regular network, you can compensate for the standard noise features of that network and any deviations in that would be a hacker, right? An intrusion try, intruder trying to figure out what's going on. So, so you can just say, yeah, those are my, you know, my, my thresholds. Whenever I detect that, reset and we're good to go again. Absolutely. So that's a great example of where um, quantum delivered resources, you know, can really multiply the effects of, you know, of what we currently have now, you know, you know, legacy types of, uh, you know, computers, you know, with being integrated with uh, a quantum-like device. So uh, more to explore on that one. Hey, thank you, Dr. Fazekon. My pleasure, Colonel Booker, thank you. Uh, now, this was, uh, this is what we're trying to do. We're, we're learning from the Defense Department uh, what the requirements are uh, and explaining our understanding, our understanding of those requirements. We're providing a solution that requires the entire quantum ecosystem uh, to, to put together and our product roadmap uh, is defines that. With that said, uh, we uh, who can help uh, uh, provide the uh, technical back for security. And I think uh, at this time, it might be very good uh, to uh, share with the comments that uh, Colonel Booker mentioned, uh, specifically uh, with, with Elena. And uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, read the question uh, and, and then get a commentary uh, from, from you, uh, Dr. Khan, uh, and from you, uh, Colonel Booker. Uh, and then I'll turn back uh, to Elena and ask her to uh, to us, if that's OK with the, with the panel. I'll take this as a yes. So the question here is, uh, wondering how classical security threat landscape translates into the internet and as asked uh, to speak. Perhaps what I should do would make more sense is I think you have a comment uh, more direct towards the latest. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask you to pose your, your question uh, uh, and uh, uh, qualify that. Uh, uh, Elena, I give you the floor. Sorry, pardon. I um didn't quite hear what you said. Um, oh. um is it okay if I speak? Yes, yes. So what I'm saying, Elena, uh, is uh, I read your question. I was wondering how classical security threat landscape translates to quantum internet. Uh, yes. Okay. Please go ahead. So my concern with the idea of quantum being unhackable. Um, in the classical computing world, most of the hacks are not actually like 
technological hacks they're psychological warfare they're um it's like you know like domestic terrorism stuff like that so basically what i want to investigate is um how the threat landscape of the classical computing world translates to the quantum computing world for so for example there's so many layers so for example um we have many legacy vulnerabilities at the hardware level uh, because we don't, we didn't build the internet. Um, we didn't build like assembly language in a way that manages memory like properly and safely. Um, the origin, the reason we have these legacy vulnerabilities is because uh, ARPANET was made in the U.S. and it was a trusted network between the colleges and the military. So there was no authentication and authorization um, protocols uh, ingrained into the infrastructure of that internet. So then when the internet became public, these holes were already existing. Um, and so now we have this interesting bottleneck where we have this conjunction where 5G, AI, IoT, blockchain, and cloud computing are sort of converging to become sort of almost like a singularity of one system. Um, the challenge here, though, is that um, we don't, the, there's going to be a bottleneck because of the power required to compute the protocols because the protocols in classical computing are very, very inefficient. If you look at like the very, like if you look at like the bit level of like a packet on a network, it is so inefficient. There is like so much wasted space. There is so much room for error. Um, There's so many protocols to regenerate like new packets if like there is an error. And so basically my, like what I want to research is, what I want to happen is not make this like mistake uh, happen again in history. We want to build like the quantum internet with like security ingrained into like the infrastructure. Um, and I may be speaking a little bit out of my field because I, I'm not as knowledgeable about like the physics uh, world, so um, that's, where, that's where Dr. Khan uh, comes in. Uh, Elaine, I'd, I'd like to also identify Elena uh, for her her uh, her um, pen testing company. Uh, is Elena was identified as the five G expert, uh, so at a at a uh, smart city level. So she's been an authorized uh, buyer president. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Elena. We've had conversations. I've spoken to your president. Uh, where you are uh, creating the pen test for a quantum city. Uh, so uh, Elena is our, is our local uh, subject matter expert where she's able to interface uh, with us and, and hasn't spoken directly to Dr. Khan the first time we're doing this. Uh, now, uh, Elena, what I'll, what I'll just do is, is share before I turn it over to Dr. Khan, because ultimately this has to be done at the physical level. Uh, and it has to be translated into what Mr. Wilkinson uh, understands the protocols for Platform One, uh, which I believe is the leading uh, uh, the leading uh, funnel uh, for for software interface uh, into DoD equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've done here, Elena, uh, because of uh, our our uh, expert in PCB, uh, we uh, have uh, looked at the current standards. Like you said yourself correctly, that we're only going to a certain level, and there's inefficiency. Those inefficiencies also. Uh, are a, a uh, non-secure. It's, it's an available, uh, it's an entry point for, for attack. And I think you're, we haven't talked about your pen testing, uh, but uh, it'd be interesting for you to validate that. But I believe that's where, that's where the smart, uh, uh, um, uh, the smart bad guys go uh, to attack. Now, exactly. thank you. So part of our, our architecture here with the dark leaf um, and with Sharon, you're working on this, something called disk five. Uh, whereas instead of working with, with regular processors uh, where you can't get into this, into this black box, you can't get in there, uh, that's where the instabilities are. And as you said, 
uh, when when uh, DARPA created ARPANET, the forerunner of the internet, it was a secure trust connection between universities and, and the government. So for the first time, we're able to get in there. We are able to get into the microcode that Dr. Khan mentioned through RISC V architecture, uh, mm -hmm. which is the backbone uh, of our roadmap for the dark leap, a hybrid quantum and providing increasing quantum functionality, not just security, but and on the classical side, the best of breed that we've never had before through the RISC V uh, architecture, which is an open architecture, which we get into the first time. So mm -hmm. we'll be leaning on, on you uh, for your thoughts and advice uh, as we begin to code that, that micro code. The micro yeah. code, however, starts at the physical level, at the quantum level. Now there's quantum computers. We talk about quantum level, you think that's quantum, but the quantum level is actually a physical reality, something that you're aware of, uh, Elena. And mm -hmm. what I'll is I'll, I'll go over to, to Dr. Khan because uh, he has created uh, intellectual property uh, based on his, his scientific papers about how to step this up through a CAD CAM approach. So it's this re-engineering, baseline re-engineering of technology. CAD uh, is computer-aided design. And one of the partners we have uh, does that uh, as a quantum level computer-aided design. We also have CAM, which is computer-aided manufacturing. So one of our partners, uh, which, is, which is Volterra, uh, which, which creates flexible uh, printed circuit board chips, even, even bio, uh, biological uh, printed circuit board chips. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will be building in uh, at the ground level the, the type of security such that there won't be a need moving forward uh, uh, for, uh, or there, there'll be there'll be a quantum, uh, a QRNG or quantum protected level of security where we micro code so, so vulnerabilities are removed. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Khan to talk about that, that physical mm -hmm. level. I just want to, sorry, I just want to mention one thing. I, one of the biggest issues that like came with classical computing is the fact that like there is no official um, like like organization that really like dictates like all of these protocols and that's where the problem comes um, because now we have you know you you look at like mobile pen testing and it's like it's insane like every single version of like Android is like totally different. Every single device, like the hardware is different. And so the issue becomes like um, maintaining, you know, as we're building like software languages, you know, when we're pen testing in classical computing. Uh, Elena, I understand what you're, what you're asking. Let us, let us place that as a second question. because we have an okay. answer for that. Uh, as you pose a, a very specific question, uh, and I've explained that we, as part of our product line, we have a way of dealing with that as a, and that's a standard. We're, we're actually mm -hmm. looking to create a standard. It'd be, it'd be sent to the ISO people, the standard people to take a look at. Uh, and uh, we're doing this as a defense level standard. So uh, we're gonna take care of the defense department first, uh, and then we'll be able to uh, share that uh, elsewhere once we have an approval. But for the moment, just to bring it back uh, to your excellent question about physical level, uh, and microcode. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Dr. Khan uh, to talk uh, about about that, where he has some expertise. Oh, you're on mute, Dr. Khan. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dave and uh, Elena. Thank you. That was a great, uh, you know, uh, question and commentary. Um, I think uh, briefly, I'll just say the following. Uh, the question that you brought up uh, in my mind has to do with the very fundamental question that physicists have been struggling with forever, uh, which is when does quantum begin and when does it end, right? Where, where's, the, where's the transitioning point from quantum to classical physics, right? Um, and um, people don't understand that yet, right? Uh, and certainly it's a question of utmost importance for the quantum technology ecosystem and beyond because, you know, how, how do you, for example, Colonel Booker uh, mentioned that, you know, you would like to take the existing technology infrastructure, right? The, the networking that you have already in place, people spend 
billions mm-hmm. of dollars on that. Rather than replacing it, you want to enhance it with quantum technologies. So you're going to interface them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, with quantum technologies. And that's what the dark leaf is meant to do. But what does that mean, right? So yeah, uh, that becomes very complicated because of the, then the threat landscape of like yes. classical computing is now merged with like exactly. the quantum threat right. landscape. So it's like, whew. yeah. Well, fortunately, <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, I think there were some really smart mathematicians, like you know, about. Uh, uh, about 80 years ago, uh, one of them was John Nash, uh, who's more popular for his uh, Nash equilibrium result. He actually came up, uh, he, he solved a very hard problem that was around at that time, 1950s and before, uh, which mathematically doesn't seem to do anything with the question we just you know, considered. How do you transition from quantum to classical, right? Yeah, but if yeah. you look at it the right way, it is exactly the right mathematical formalism to talk about this problem. And fortunately for us, John Nash actually solved the problem Mm -hmm. in 1952 or 54, I think. So are we in a position to address that remarkable question that you brought up? Yes. Can we do it uh, so that we can make some money off of it by making some technology that is, you know, beautiful in the sense that you had in mind? Uh, Probably not yet, but Mm -hmm. uh, certainly worth you know, getting an effort going in that direction is, is what I would say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so Elena, uh, to conclude uh, this, this segment, uh, the, uh, you have, uh, I think Dr. Khan uh, has identified that there is a threat landscape. Uh, there is a need uh, to be able to, at a low level, uh, as part of your expertise and your company's expertise, the ability uh, to, to penetration test, to pen test. As we move from the classical to a architecture, uh, a quantum internet, uh, the threats will show up. The movement will show up. You identify the actual problem, which is people, psychological. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, we're not the there will not be machines. There will be people that will be making mistakes uh, as they begin to increment increment the technology, and that's where I believe there's a threat landscape. So what we will be doing is identifying that off screen. We will turn to you uh, as you are working on a a white paper uh, to identify those things. And I I think that from this meetup, uh, you can clearly from Dr. Khan said, uh, there is a uh, a requirement uh, for what you're doing. I'll Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll turn to uh, Colonel Booker for comment. Yeah, Elena and uh, Dr. Faisal uh, Khan. I would tell you, as, as you think through that problem, is, you know, think about the agencies you need to coordinate with. Most times we want the senior agency to help drive the change. But I would tell you that as you partner with those agencies, you know, collaborate and you drive the change. Because if you're looking for a national or global mandate, if those agency partners aren't willing to come together and come up with one set standard, you know, then it has to be your collaboration to drive those agencies to do the change. So I'm sure in your network, Elena, and uh, your network through Dr. Khan, there's probably, a, a, I call it an intermediary, you know, someone who's on your side who could advocate for you on your behalf to help drive that change to get to one standard um, um, type of protocol. And I would tell you, Dr. Fazekhan, um, and unlike the DOD, Right. We're not seeking a return on investment of then, you know, the security and the safety, you know, um, risk prevention for the soldier. But in the business enterprise, you know, it's about the income sheet. Right. So you, as you think through the agencies and driving that change, you know, you know, what's the win win area or a quick win that can show that you know, the vulnerability can be met? Because you, you know it exists, but I think you, you know this is the point where you have to drive that change. Mm-hmm. So, so if I if I may add here, uh, uh, Elena, uh, Colonel Booker has identified a need uh, for the state that he identified, uh, and he's identified uh, some of the agencies that are involved. Uh, we have quite a lot of geniuses. I. Okay. 
Like, so, to be so, totally so, honest, so, so, I am not a good minister. I am a good consultant. But, so. like, some of the people um, that I work with, they are, like, they're beyond geniuses. Um, so, Elena, uh, we, uh, you are qualified, your company is qualified. Uh, so we had, uh, which, which is, at, and uh, we can share that background information offline uh, with, with Colonel Bookard. Mm -hmm. uh, Coming back to what I was saying is that uh, we've identified your company as being uh, DOD relevant. Uh, you have the you have the, the check mark there. So my next question then here is, uh, uh, could we look towards you? Could we look to your company uh, to be an organization to help create the standard, uh, create the, the cybersecurity standard that could be shared uh, by Colonel Booker uh, to the agencies that he has in mind. Would that be that is, yes? yes. That is absolutely what I want to do. And um, yeah, um, okay. I've been um, in a bit of a medical bind for the last couple. Uh, Elena, we can but, talk about we can talk about uh, and you know thank you for for coming today because uh, yeah. you. You know, uh, I'm aware of your situation. Uh, we don't need to speak about that uh, uh, publicly here, uh, but I uh, appreciate that you that you are here today uh, to give your voice and to to speak of those matters. What I'd like to do now is move forward on our agenda. The time it's approaching uh, 12:30, and uh, I'm looking uh, for another 15 minutes uh, to bring in another topic, uh, and I'll return uh, back to. Uh, uh, Dr. Khan, uh, Colonel Booker, and Mr. Wilkinson as the as the speakers. Uh, we have another time for another topic, and then what I suggest is, uh, gentlemen, in the last 15 minutes, uh, we wind it down, make some notes in terms of of, of to dos. Uh, so, uh, Elena, you're free to communicate with me uh, as we usually do uh, offline, uh, mm -hmm. and. If you have any other notes, uh, please just uh, text them to me, and I'll 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 build them in, and okay. make them, uh, moving forward. But uh, thank you for that that commentary. You've added value as we've been working on this uh, for years. In fact, and again, thank you for for joining us uh, despite uh, uh, dealing with the uh, the medical issue. <laughs> You're so welcome. Yeah, this is um, very important to me. So yeah. You've been working, you've been, you've been working I'm really excited to work with you guys and like hey thanks again to Elena again you know again as a person who's not a you know who's a non-physicist and a non-mathematician right you know I'm one of those individuals who could help bridge that gap between you know what you've been researching and how to communicate that in an operationalized term that mm -hmm. defense industry partners can understand so I would just challenge you and others to continue to expand your point of conversation outside your network. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. And I don't know if um, Dave may have shared my cyber warfare, um, like, I guess, these thesis with you all um, already, but. Um, Elena, uh, off, offline I have, but let's move okay. that to a separate, a separate uh, uh, event. Uh, okay. At the moment, uh, we're going to move, if you could put your microphone off, uh, we're going to move forward now as we're tight on time. Okay. Uh, to, the, to the next. Yeah, part of me. Sorry for taking up that. <laughs> so, um, it's yes. all good. So we're moving forward now. Uh, so gentlemen, uh, we have, uh, I want to come back uh, to discussion uh, of the points that uh, Colonel Booker has provided us. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, we're organizing a quantum ecosystem uh, and related uh, organizations who want to show up at our meetup so we can talk to them, make decisions, uh, and, and move uh, Colonel Booker's agenda uh, forward. So uh, just as a recap, uh, quantum is a disruptive technology. It's able to do what was formerly impossible. The challenge that we have, we find in the ecosystem is the narrow-mindedness uh, by not having imagination by not having scientific papers that support that, or perhaps scientific papers, and then the imagination to be able to use that. That has been the, the challenge uh, since the dawn of time, uh, quite frankly. Now, uh, Colonel Burkett has mentioned the, the Joint All-Domain Command and Control. Uh, I had identified at the beginning of this conversation 
that there are two constraints. Uh, one, uh, Colonel Booker mentioned, well, actually both of you mentioned, uh, one being uh, how can we have devices communicate with each other securely? And a second uh, is how can uh, this information be consumed? Because the, the amount of information that is now becoming available is overwhelming. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we wanna talk about that, but I'd also like uh, Dr. Khan uh, in that specifically, uh, if you can talk uh, uh, about, nav we talk about navigation, uh, there's timing capability. So precision, so we have assured pre precision position. Position has to do with GPS, we've addressed that. Uh, navigation, I believe has to do with, with GPS. I think we've addressed that. Uh, and timing, however, I don't think has been addressed. Let me first ask Colonel Booker for, did I evaluate that correctly? Yes, um, I'd say in a, yes, you, you did, um, without getting in, into the finer details of, of the GPS and the position navigation and timing, it, it works together, right? So we do know there are some things that, um, you know, that the Defense Department is working on in terms of making those, you know, timing clocks much smaller, you know, the size, weight, and the power, which um, the power is the biggest piece. You know, you know, back to Elena's point, you got a lot of systems that's moving, but how are you powering it? But in this particular case, you know, we're talking about the positioning. You know, if that signal is jammed, you know, through, you know, the satellite, you know, that's within the, um, uh, the secure cloud, Right, and the cloud is not encrypted properly to the point of using it's in you know there's a network intrusion, you know, um, or hacked inside that cloud. Right, that poses a problem for all things in the um, interconnectedness of the sensor mission web that we're going towards for the Department of Defense. Again, you know what I stated earlier is that the Pentagon we envision the battlefield to be. Um, interconnected web of sensors and each sensor is connected you know however you know the individual sensor who's not connected to the you know to the parent system will still perform but if that system is dependent on a satellite and the satellite you know gps is you know is you know is inoperable that poses a huge problem so i think you know phasal con you know dr con as he described um the 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 Quan earlier, um, I think was uh, you know, roadmap button two, roadmap button three. You know, those are good ways to help support you know what the Defense Department is moving towards. You know that chip integrated, dark leaf integrated on that platform. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Colonel Booker. What I'm what I'm seeking to do. So it sounds like we've covered the first of three bullets. Yes, really, we, we talked through all three, you know, and thanks to, you know, Dr. Khan, you know, he, he, he weaved those points in the conversation as well. Um, I think, you know, again, back to what the last conversation um, was, you know, how and where can quantum delivered resources multiplied effects for commercially developed quantum computers, right, to solve DOD hardest analytical problems, right? You know, not only the targeting, but mapping above ground and subterranean, or even, you know, you think about global and now um, low earth orbit, you know, logistical resupplies, right? You know, how is that working? When we're thinking about a Q city, a quantum city, I imagine that city is gonna be autonomous, you know, you know, you know, quite a bit, right? So, and you know, whether or not it's unmanned or man or man in the loop, there's, there is a processing, you know, there's there's a processing chip that's making those systems move and communicate. So if it's a typical, you know, depending on where you are, your internet signal is not as fast as, and it's being interrupted by, you know, by physical barriers, right? That's the problem, you know, but if you're, you know, you know, in a place where you provide the peacekeeping, humanitarian support, or combat type of support, you cannot have those interruptions, yep. right? So I think that's the conversation, you know, really, you know, these are hard problems, you know, I look forward to, you know, uh, you know, working and hearing from uh, this group in the, in the future to see, you know, how we can help support, you know, the Defense Department. 
Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Booker. Uh, and we do want to hear from you, uh, David, in, in a moment. Uh, just to review this, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Khan has, has weaved together uh, uh, a, uh, a uh, conversation that addressed the first bullet point. I recall that Dr. Khan uh, uh, has spoken somewhat uh, about quantum sensing. And Dr. Khan, your, your uh, quantum sensing scientific paper is, is, is coming out, is it later this year? Yeah, that's, that's the plan. That's right. The plan. So what, we, what we've done uh, with the leadership of, of uh, David Wilkinson, uh, and I think it was because of uh, uh, Major General uh, Nick Justice, uh, who uh, was assigned to work with you by the Air Force, you were telling me, uh, had an interest in quantum sensing. And so uh, this is where uh, you had your uh, focus uh, and we're bringing quite that capability. Uh, so we had actually put that aside for a while, uh, Colonel, uh, in order to address uh, the financial uh, and build up a, a, a JADC2 approach that was reasonable where we could pull in more quantum ecosystem partners uh, and rather than start with the rarefied, um, the rarefied requirement. What is very good here is now we've heard from you, Colonel Booker, this rarefied requirement of quantum sensing. And so we can now turn to the quantum ecosystem and say, uh, we, we need your help. You're part of the solution. We want to pull this together uh, in order to provide best of breed uh, products. Uh, so there will be products that will come, come out of this. Uh, I, uh, we can uh, hear that the uh, Sentinel product, uh, so I'll just move this uh, back here. The Sentinel product upgrade communication device is a quantum security interface to, to, to Gambit. Uh, this, this Sentinel device, which also exists uh, uh, in our FinTech product line, uh, is the uh, preliminary of a type of tricorder. Uh, so when we add the quantum sensing to this, uh, it'll have sensory abilities, uh, just as the iPhone is ubiquitous understanding. It's a device that you can use for multiple communication. We are basically uh, in the spirit of, of Steve Jobs building on the same approach, just advancing things so we don't have to start from scratch. Uh, and uh, you can expect some sort of tricorder uh, capability uh, that is aligned uh, to the, uh, the bullets and the, and the diagram that you have. Now, this last item here, uh, which is the, uh, or before we, before we move on, uh, uh, Mr. Wilkinson, uh, uh, would, you, would you like to, 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 uh, to talk about quantum sensing? Sure, I would say if by tricorder you mean a network of quantum clocks, then yes, that is exactly uh, what what needs to happen, um, and that's exciting. Uh, so that's you know I think part of part of the thing that uh, we always try to hit home on is that we are all passionate about science fiction, and we want to go to space. We want to have all, you know all the all the wonderful things that we saw in sci-fi movies that made us you know, look up at the stars and, and say, wow, you know, I wish, I wish we could do that. I think, I think that we're, you know, we're at a point, a really unique point in, uh, in history where things are moving very quickly technologically. And we, uh, you know, we're very lucky that we get to be a part of this kind of uh, next chapter here. So I'll leave it at that, Dave. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, so there's more to come. Uh, there is quite uh, an exciting uh, lineup. But what we're, but our goal here, uh, as 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 Mr. Wilkinson grounded us, uh, a network of quantum of of atomic clocks. Uh, so based on old technology, we're simply reusing it in clever ways. This is our quantum garage approach, uh, where through the scientific paper, Dr. Khan. Uh, we uh, are able to uh, lay out uh, a scientific path. Uh, and as Dr. Khan pr provides the roadmap as a product, uh, we turn to our subject matter expertise outside the company within, for example, Mr. Wilkinson, uh, and we're able to integrate from the point of view of the DOD. That's what we're uh, representing. 
I would uh, like to turn to time check is uh, 22, uh, is to talk about this, this last bullet here. How and where can quantum delivered resources multiply effects for commercially developed quantum computers to solve DOD's hardest analytical problems? And whereas we've spoken in general to this, I would like to hear from you, Colonel Bookard, uh, your list of the hardest analytical problems. Yeah, um, again, as uh, I'll just reiterate, you know, there's, uh, without going into classifications here, when you think about global logistics, you know, that's going to be done um, across the uh, many nations, many countries, and now low Earth orbit, right? You know, where we're moving towards, uh, you think about, um, um, you, know, you, know, you know, how we solve problems with mapping underground or mapping under sea, right? Those are some some challenges where, you know, we've just not broken it into that space here, you know, but I think when I, you know, it, it amazes me when I think about the random number generator, Right, you know how that process is working, and it's painting a picture for someone to be able to, you know, make a decision from. So, in the world of national security, you know, you know, reverse engineered type of way, how is that same procedure done when you're looking for certain criteria, or when you're sniffing for chemicals, or when you're in a, you know, again mapping underneath, you know, certain types of terrain. So there are some problems that you know I think that we won't be able to talk about here, but um, if there is a way for us to hear from the audience and see if there are some things that the audience has thought about or if they sent questions in, you know I'd, I'd really like to hear you know what they're thinking um, because sometimes you know we're looking at from our our vantage view because we're doing it based on the dollars that's appropriated to solve these these particular problems and the particular hard problems where we you know what the DOD is solving is, um, again, secure comms between Army, Navy, Air Force. You know, we're looking at uh, quantum cloud that secured um, inertial um, <clears throat> and secure uh, sensors with assured precision, global and positioning for targeting. So those are some some hard problems, you know, that we're solving, um, you know, that we're using legacy equipment to do but needs to be ingested with uh no kid you know uh, future technology and we think you know, quantum has an advantage and it's disruptive enough um to be able to help us solve those problems here. Uh, thank you colonel the uh you had mentioned uh, global logic uh, and I, I note that uh, uh, Captain Jeffrey Cole uh, is on is on our call. Shout out to to Captain Cole. Uh, Captain Cole, uh, a 777 787 Dreamliner uh, pilot uh, for a few decades, has been our eyes and ears uh, on global logistics, a problem and solution, where we've been working with them for a number of months. And that product uh, is called uh, Schedule, uh, 4.1 Schedule, Time Schedule Optimization. Uh, whereas we're taking the approach uh, that from a pilot's point of view, we want to be able to see what's required uh, to move from, from point A to point B, but then the logistics of solving that, which includes maintenance as well as supply chain. Uh, it would. It would. Uh, you asked for uh, support from the uh, from the crowd, uh, from from our guests. Uh, why don't we start with uh, uh, Captain Cole? Uh, if we can have a few words uh, from you, uh, what you think the challenges are, and how you see uh, quantum solving it, and how you see the quantum ecosystem that we shared with you, uh, having that ability uh, under your leadership. Oh, I, th I think you're on, on mute, Captain Cole. How was that? That's better. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, I think that, you know, that there's, there's, 
uh, several things that overlap with the military um, uh, considerations and um, seeing the graphics of, of communications between um, all the facets of the military um, regarding um, what is required for commercial aviation. We have GPSs, we have satellites, the same, uh, the same things. Um, technology usually develops for the commercial airline industry through the military. Um, of course, we don't have the same um, uh, needs for the type security that military has, but we have this, the, the, the same consideration. So, so, you know, for example, in our 787, uh, we have a head, head up display, which is a military application in fighter jets, and it makes our job easier. So the transition from um, legacy computers and computing and old satellites is very relevant for the commercial uh, side of aviation. And we need to move on to the next level as well, because in the future, there's going to be hacking. There's going to be things that um, can't be controlled. And that is with uh, the GPS navigation. It's also with air traffic control. So that's another consideration that um, air traffic needs to update. Um, they need secure systems. And this is part and parcel of what we're looking at. And, and as I said, the same things that evolve through the military are going to have to be um, in the commercial realm as well. And you know, our scheduling, for example, the system that we're looking at um, will bring in a quant to make the efficiencies better. There's, there's a whole other aspect to commercial aviation, uh, profit levels and other things that um, um, outside of the security considerations that airlines are looking for advantages. And the whole scheduling system that we're considering um, with quantum will bring in the optimization of uh, pilots, of maintenance, of, of uh, uh, planning uh, flights, for example, through um, integrating um, air traffic controls with companies. And that's another thing that quantum can do. So there's a whole host of things and, and um, you know, the sky's the limit to coin a phrase. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Captain Cole. Uh, so uh, what, as you, you identified both uh, security uh, as, as well as, as uh, scheduling items, uh, cost reduction, uh, coordination, and uh, the, uh, in your opinion, uh, where you're the subject matter expert as a pilot, as a license, a current licensed pilot, uh, you, in terms of uh, the quantum ecosystems, that that's Dark Star, and what you've learned about uh, these QRNG chips, and what you've learned uh, about uh, quantum computers uh, that we've uh, uh, mentioned the what is your assessment right now oh and you also you participated uh, in a meetup you were the you were the main speaker of the meetup uh where you're providing information uh and then uh dr khan and his and his team uh, i believe it was nada uh from the uae and also a d-wave uh developer uh that uh we, we began to you began to observe how we took the data that you created for us. So uh, Colonel Booker, uh, what Captain Cole did was uh, created a, a large set of, of instructions. These are the, the coordinates, or sorry, the, these are the priorities uh, that he has to go through, uh, both uh, the famous you know, in-flight checklist, but as well as what was happened prior to that. In addition to that, uh, 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 Colonel, uh, in addition to that, Captain Cole, uh, you had uh, exposed us uh, to that uh, tens of thousands of maintenance line items. Uh, uh, what was that called again, Captain Cole? Uh, dispatch deficiency list, the DDL. Right, dispatch deficiency list. So part of uh, what is in scope for us, uh, Colonel Bookard, is the dispatch deficiency list to turn it from a reactive process where you have inconsistent expertise based on the, the lead engineer, lead maintenance person, moving it into an AI system uh, where there is feedback, which does not exist right now in the airline industry from what I understand uh, that Captain Cole has told us. So by introducing feedback where two systems can speak with each other, best practices emerge. 
And this may be a tremendous mechanism for uh, uh, reducing the cost and the timing uh, and the constraints of, of maintenance. Uh, now, this isn't a statement I've made uh, directly to Captain Cole before, so let's hear it live. Uh, Captain Cole, may I have your assessment uh, of, of the statement I just made? Uh, yes, well, exactly. Um, you know, again, we're, it's, it's a profit uh, driven business, essentially aviation, uh, the margins are very narrow. And one of the big concerns is proper maintenance. Um, it usually leads to massive delays, which cost the company money. And um, there are so many inefficiencies in it. We do have this uh, um, uh, book essentially of all the things that um, are required for the aircraft to be serviceable. And um, we get into the aircraft and they have a flight, something isn't working properly. We go through the checks and we call maintenance, they come to the aircraft. But there are some things that um, Boeing created the book. Um, some things aren't in the book and it leads to, um, in some instances, calling maintenance and long delays. And as you said, if we can get a way, um, more efficient way to link that, and if that is through AI or um, even, even putting all the information on a quantum computer system, which can get to the um, actual fact of the matter and what is relevant to our flight that day and whether we can leave or not. Ultimately, it's the captain's decision, but if I can get better information for me to make that decision, it can help. And this is where I see where quantum can fit in. Um, again, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it's a very complicated issue, but, but I see quantum um, having, having a great solution for it. Oh, that's, uh, that's wonderful. I'm just gonna share for, for a moment uh, uh, the Quantum Kid comic uh, that illustrates this. Uh, here on the uh, left hand uh, left hand pane uh, or strip, uh, we have the DDL uh, maintenance machine. Uh, this drawing here of a little robot, uh, Sharanya, if, if, if uh, perhaps that can be something we can program uh, Robotica to do, since it has an articulated arm, uh, a Canada arm, so to speak. Uh, that Sharanya, like myself, uh, is in Canada, uh, and it's being powered by the Dark Leaf. Uh, which the airplane has as well. This is an original artwork by 10-year-old Aaron the Quantum Kid. And what we have here is the pre-flight dispatch deficiency list quantum AI repair feedback loop. Uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Khan, we have not had this conversation before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you if you, if you can uh, uh, speak to this in terms of a, of a productization that is a automated process uh, where Captain Cole 777 and the Jarvis Cortana repair bot, uh, well, Dark Leaf, oh, well, Twinkle at the Quantum Entangled Spot. Okay, putting that aside, uh, let's suggest uh, that Twinkle is that they solve the problem. Uh, so by having an automated process, DDL, speaking to the, 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 uh, device, in this case, uh, an airplane, uh, can you visualize, uh, first of all, do you feel comfortable having the uh, scientific paper background, uh, your own, never mind someone else's, and can you visualize a product where we can use Sharanya's uh, uh, experiment type robot, uh, which looks like this, and uh, turn that into a product uh, where through Captain Cole, uh, we can get access to maybe the uh, uh, 787 Dreamliner uh, DDL book. Uh, and uh, with Mr. Wilkinson's expertise and knowing how to interface this with Platform One, which is the airline's standard uh, of software integration, uh, be able to uh, uh, turn that into a product. What is, what is your assessment? Uh, thanks, Dave. So, um... My assessment would be, you know, I guess I can, what I can do is I can uh, kind of put together what uh, uh, Captain Cole just was saying uh, and uh, which what has been part of the conversation so far. So, so it looks like, you know, there's this uh, networking question, right? Uh, that Colonel Booker brought up. That's kind of the, you know, the quantum super, super inf quantum information superhighway that you, you coined, right? 
that's uh, where all of this seems to fit in, right? Uh, you have a maintenance machine, uh, which uh, Sharania puts together, I believe, right? That's uh, that's where, where her robot, robotica comes in. Uh, you want that to be connected to uh, a through a quantum network for security, right? To make sure there's no hacking taking place or mitigate that at least. Uh, to a quantum network, which is, you know, connected with quantum processors or, you know, uh, digital annealers or, or even regular supercomputers, right? All working together uh, with, you know, enhanced software like, you know, AI, as, as um, Jeffrey just mentioned, machine learning algorithms, AI algorithms kind of all working in unison uh, to deliver exactly what uh, I think uh, is being asked for here. So, so I guess the the, the point, for, for the idea from the point for, point of view that I have is that it's a, it's a question of you know how can you bring all these uh, different uh, members of different ecosystems together, right, in in one cohesive sort of uh, effort, and and uh, deliver on these uh, you know these remarkable promises uh, that are you know in principle possible. You're on mute, Dave. Thank you. Uh, so you, you heard it live here uh, that uh, we'll add this uh, to the product line. Uh, we'll have an, an off-line uh, conversation with uh, Captain Cole and, and Mr. Wilkinson uh, to uh, determine how to productize this. So we have we have many comics here uh, that describe these are the these are actually the notes the, the meeting minutes uh, turned into graphics uh, that we believe we can turn to a product. But I look to, to in the middle, we have uh, the quantum kid who drew this for us, uh, who is attending today. We'll look forward to more notes uh, turn into graphics that can turn into a product. And I notice here we have US Navy Space Seal. Uh, so I, I will, uh, I will uh, shout out, uh, as I'm not sure I should be identifying uh, the name, but we do have a, a US Navy Seal who is attending. Uh, and we will look uh, uh, for his version of, of the uh, airplane, uh, uh, which is, uh, has some exciting uh, background, uh, including there's a nuclear sub uh, that is also part of the devices that we've been asked to quantize, uh, asked to secure as part of an exercise, which we'll be doing through the US, uh, the US Navy SEAL team. Uh, we have three minutes to go, and, and, and th thank you, uh, David, for uh, sharing this, this picture. Uh, this is an example uh, of uh, an advanced chip uh, that we're creating. This is a flexible piece uh, that we created. Uh, I think you were with us, Colonel Booker, as a guest uh, when we were printing these live. This was, was prepared. Uh, it's being uh, sent to me, and we're going to begin to incorporate this uh, into the into the uh, the robotica robot, uh, which is uh, diagrammed here. It actually exists. Let me show that to you. Uh, we have a uh, we have a kids version of, of it here, enhanced. Uh, but I can show you the actual robot. Uh, that's actually three D printed on a uh, PET film, which is flexible. So. Our product name is the Dark Leaf, we, uh, that, whose name hails from the quantum mechanical properties found in a leaf during photosynthesis. Uh, in this way, we've created a chip that is be uh, bendable so that it is somewhat like a leaf. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, and, and thank you for that, because that was the most important uh, exercise with the Dark Leaf. It was meant to actually replicate a leaf. Uh, so here we have uh, Sharanya, and, and here is their partially assembled uh, a robot, uh, robotica that we're using. Uh, so back to our product line, as I see the time and it's 12.59. Uh, and we're meant to end at, at one o'clock. I would uh, uh, like to wind down uh, the, the presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wilkinson, uh, for allowing us uh, to debut uh, with our, with our uh, guest speaker of honor, Colonel Bookard, uh, along with our, our friends, uh, Dr. Dr. Faisal Shah Khan, uh, uh, with the other members of Dark Star who I previously identified. And 
uh, we're quite happy that uh, to uh, you're able to share with us, uh, Colonel Booker, uh, your diagram here uh, and the interest uh, for the purpose of organizing the quantum ecosystem. And we will be sharing this this data out uh, to uh, the partners who couldn't be here today, and for those we can identify as being relevant uh, to the DoD goals. Uh, perhaps we can have a cl a closing uh, remark uh, from Dr. Khan, uh, Mr. Wilkinson, and then to, to you, Colonel Booker, uh, Dr. Khan. Um, thank you, Dave. This is uh, you know an excellent uh, uh, you know event today. I, I was really uh, you know, honored to uh, have Colonel Booker, uh, you know, being on the panel and having a conversation with him uh, in, a, in a sort of a live, you know, exchange. Uh, that's that's uh, very useful for me. And I hope the audience also found that useful. And um, I, you know, look forward to further events of the same type. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Wilkinson. I want to echo that. Uh, thank you so much, Colonel. Thank you, uh, everybody who was able to join us today. Uh, I hope this was a productive discussion for you and your understanding of, of how uh, quantum is going to play a role in the defense and space industry going forward. If you've got more questions, reach out to us um, and we can have some conversations offline. Uh, thank you all so much, Dave. Oh, uh, thank you, David. And uh, your, your words, uh, Colonel Booker. Hey, thank you again, uh, Dr. Wilkerson and uh, Dr. Uh, Faisal uh, Khan, you know, for inviting me to, to speak today. I would tell you, just let's continue. Let's all continue to expand the quantum conversations outside of our networks, right? You know, similar to other efforts, you know, it starts small, but it will catch fire. The Pentagon, when we say envision, you know, we're moving in that direction uh, to ensure that the future battlefields are interconnected webs of sensors. Right, that pass data to the warfighters. So if, if you take take those things away, I'm sure what you're working on in, in your spaces will be able to help support um, you know the defense. Again, thank you for inviting me and have a wonderful day. Uh, thank you, Colonel Booker. Uh, so thank you to our other speakers. Uh, for example, uh, Elena and and uh, Captain Cole, uh, recognizing uh, Alexander Jivov of Quantum Amplify working with us to achieve the quantum, uh, the cir quantum circular economy. Uh, thank you, Vera, uh, for uh, supporting us uh, as our director of, of media. Uh, thank you, uh, Quantum Kid, uh, for uh, creating relevant uh, diagrams uh, that you work with uh, your, uh, your team. Uh, and I was pleased to see that we were able to use that and turn it into a, a diagram. I hope I haven't missed anyone else. Uh, thank you, Sharanya. Uh, we did see you wave, didn't have an opportunity to speak on this meetup. Uh, the time is now uh, 103. Uh, thank you uh, for everyone who joined us, uh, giving up uh, the core hours of, of a Saturday. And uh, we look forward to your commentary. Uh, please find us on, on LinkedIn. Uh, there will be, uh, and add your comments. Uh, we'd love to know about you. And as, as Colonel Booker had mentioned, uh, we seek your input. Uh, we are open to your input as to ideas. And we will bring those to the Colonel. Uh, that's, our, that's our place. This is, this is the position, the responsibility that we're taking up for the quantum ecosystem, whether it's a large company or it's an individual, whether it's a startup. Uh, we want to support you. We want to we want your words uh, to, to reach uh, the top levels of the DOD through Colonel Booker, who represents all six services, the US Navy, US Army, US Space Force, uh, and the three others. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, the uh, main speakers uh, to, to remain. Uh, and for everyone else, uh, thank you.